Hello, I'm Doug McNeil and welcome to Mostly Climate. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment. What are the risks to the UK and how do we begin to address those? Joining me today is Dr. Rosie Oakes. She's a climate scientist here at the Met Office. Rosie, welcome. You recently joined the Met Office, didn't you? Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me along. So I'm in the International Climate Services team, and we work with people from around the world to help them prepare for the risks that they face from climate change. So we find out what risks people are facing and then work with climate scientists from the Met Office to deliver the information that they need to help them make decisions. Well, great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for coming. So uh, we're going to be discussing a technical report today prepared ahead of the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment, which was published back in June. And to talk us through the findings, we're joined by one of the authors, Professor Richard Betts. So what was your involvement in the technical report? And tell us uh, what you do here at the Met Office as well. My involvement in the technical report was to actually lead the production of the entire report, leading an amazing team of experts across many disciplines of climate science and relating to climate science. We've talked about the UK climate projections before. Can you just uh, describe briefly what those are? So the UK climate projections are a huge set of uh, computer model simulations of how both the global and the UK climate may play out uh, in the future using uh, computer models for the weather forecast in the Met Office. And we make different assumptions about how the buildup of greenhouse gases may happen in the future. And looking at different levels of high and low buildup, we can see how how severely uh, the climate may change. Things like changing extreme weather events, changing the background climate, changing long-term sea level rise, and basically characterising the future to allow us to assess the risk of climate change. Well, that's fantastic. We'll come back to that in a minute, I think. At the moment, can you talk about uh, the context for the report? What's happening? What have you been writing? What is that feeding into? Well, the ultimate motivation is the Climate Change Act 2008. Under that act, the UK government is required to report to Parliament every five years with a risk assessment of the risk that climate change poses to the UK. And to make that assessment, the government asks uh, its independent advisory body, the Climate Change Committee, for advice, who in turn ask experts for uh, all the detail about what's going on. And our technical report was that input there. Importantly, we laid out a kind of prioritisation list of which risks and also opportunities are most urgent in terms of action to adapt to them. I mentioned opportunities. There are a few opportunities from climate change, but they're vastly outweighed by the risks. And actually, you won't realise the opportunities unless the risks are addressed as well. But importantly, it's about helping with prioritisation so the government can ultimately decide what to do when they're investing uh, in adaptation to climate change and where to make a start. You talk about this is a risk assessment, and I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what we mean by risk. We don't just mean negative things, do we? There's other aspects to climate change risks. The concept of risk, there's quite a lot in it. Uh, First of all, it's not about trying to make predictions. You can't make firm predictions of what will actually happen far into the future, of course. But you can uh, you can see what what may happen, which could be a threat to people biodiversity, uh, society, and so on. And it's about uh, trying to recognise these potential dangers so we can avoid them through mitigation, through reducing emissions, and also, but also for those which we can't avoid, adapt to them to reduce the overall impact. And that brings in the other component of climate risk, which means it's not just about what's happening with the weather, you know, more extreme rainfall and uh, high temperatures and, and, and so on, which we call the weather hazard. It's also about how that plays out in society or in ecosystems and the character of those is important so for people and communities it's about the exposure it's about how many people are in harm's way so are you living in housing development on a floodplain for example that's exposure and also vulnerability what happens if you are hit by a flood for example do you have insurance is your house built to withstand a minor level of flooding or whatever Uh, are you psychologically able to deal with flooding and, and so on so it's much more than just the climate about how people respond as well and the same is true for ecosystems and biodiversity as well so it's a big concept and it's not just about the weather itself. Rosie you were at the recent launch of both the technical report and the risk report what were your impressions of the day what impressed you at the launch? 
I went to the launch obviously as a climate scientist and so I assumed I would know a lot of what would be talked about but I think what really came along was the urgency that is behind this report so I've learned about climate change since I was 10 years old in school you know and you know these are the predictions what's going to happen and one of the key messages that came across was the climate change that has been predicted is actually here and we need to do something about it. The climate has already changed, it's going to continue to change. And the things that we have in place at the moment, they're not enough. And the gap between how prepared we are and how prepared we need to be has got bigger over the last five years since the last report. And so for me, that was quite shocking. I don't know why, because I should know about these things, but it really hit home that even though we are preparing for climate change in some ways, we need to really increase that effort and they've provided the material in these reports for us to know how to prioritise those efforts. Yeah, I wanted to talk here, I guess, about timescales. I, I thought this was a really interesting thing. Most of the time, as climate scientists and, and perhaps a lot of the narrative and public discussion about climate change, when you know, mention climate change to friends or whatever, is about mitigation. And uh, actually here, this report is really focused on adaptation timescales. I wonder, um, Rich, if you want to talk about the difference between those timescales and the different approaches of mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation is about avoiding further climate change is happening. And of course, we know that we're driving climate change, global warming by building up more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, particularly carbon dioxide, and to reduce that and to ultimately stop the warming, uh, we need to bring emissions to zero or at least net zero. That needs to happen urgently, needs to start urgently. And the, uh, many countries, including the UK, have an ambition to bring emissions to net zero by the middle of the century. But even if that happens, which may or may not happen uh, that soon, even if that does happen, there's still a, a certain amount of climate change already locked in. And as Rosie was just saying, a lot of climate change has already happened anyway. We are living with a climate with different weather patterns to 30 years ago, which means that a lot of our national infrastructure, for example, and buildings and roads and railways are not set up to what the climate is now and the risks that could happen, the potential heavy rainstorms, for example, a lot of building designs just aren't ready for that and the high temperatures. So adaptation is about dealing with that mismatch and about making sure that we are set up to live with the climate as it is now and the further climate change that is inevitable, whilst also trying to avoid the worst changes in the future through mitigation. So we had a nice walk uh, the other day. We went for a nice walk and we were walking along Topsham uh, by the pubs there. And I noticed that along the uh, bottom of the doors of a bunch of pubs were floodgates. So this is an adaptation to something that's happening now, to climate change that is happening already. Is that right? You know, how has sea level rise affected Topsham, which is a little port down the road from Exeter? How has it affected Topsham? Topsham being sort of yeah, just at sea level, or at least by the sort of tidal uh, reaches of the River X, it has to cope with uh, the extreme high tides that do occur. And they're, they're already a little bit higher, you know, a few centimetres or tens of centimetres higher than they would have been 100 years ago. And the town of Topsham is several hundred years old. So uh, things have already changed in that time. As sea level continues to rise, the lower level parts of the town will be flooded more frequently than they already are. It won't just be the most extreme high tides, it would be other high tides as well. Sea level rise is one of those things where actually you're, you're committed to ongoing change, even if you urgently stop climate change, because glaciers around the world take a long time to melt under higher temperatures, decades to centuries, which means they're going to continue putting more water into the oceans. So the oceans are going to continue to rise for decades or centuries, even if we achieve net zero by 2050 and stop global warming. So we have to live with a certain amount of sea level rise. Uh, and it could be that the UK could see up to half a metre or slightly more sea level rise by the end of the century and more in coming centuries, even if the world succeeds in limiting global warming. That could be the minimum. But if we don't stop global warming, if we don't reduce emissions rapidly enough, we could see even more over a metre of sea level rise by the end of the century, potentially, or, or more than that. So that could be a big difference between the global and UK sea level rises. And that would mean that the high tides in Topsham would be causing more flooding events under the ongoing climate change scenario, but they would still have more of an impact even under the low scenario. That's really interesting um, about the future changes and the stuff that we're already committed to. I find it hard to put all these numbers in my head. Um, you two mentioned that you were going to the pub 
So uh, I think the current sea level rise in the UK since the 1900s has risen by about 15 centimetres. So that's about the height of a pint glass. And the projections for the end of the century from the CCRA3 report are saying between 50 and 80 centimetres. So I've been measuring my kitchen furniture this morning and 50 centimetres is about the height of a chair and 80 centimetres is about the height of a table. So if you think about that in context of Topsham, that is actually quite a lot of extra water. And obviously, like you say, they'll be affected by the tides as well. But just to help people put that into context, the kind of future that we're looking at. Absolutely. And I guess there's a lot of complex things that are going on in a particular place, aren't there? So this is not a particular forecast, if you like, for Topsham, but I guess a, a good idea about the different levels of sea level rise might happen. And also that's going to interact with a bunch of other things. So storm surges, for example, and if the frequency of storms changes, you might get more frequent, very high tides. Was that covered in the report as well? Exactly. These things will happen more often. So you, it's not just a matter of living with them occasionally, it'll be a matter of living with them on a very regular basis. So just before we get into some of the other details of what this means for the UK, I just wanted to ask you about the overall science approach that was taken, and particularly the approach to the possible future worlds, because obviously there's a huge number of choices that society is facing in terms of mitigation. And it gets very complicated. There are a lot of different greenhouse gases that might go up and down at various different times. A lot of political targets, a lot of targets for net zero, and that might work out in a whole bunch of ways. Can you tell me about the approach you took in terms of looking at the lower risk and the higher risk futures in terms of the sort of global projections of climate change? Basically, we looked at the level of risk associated with different levels of global warming and what that would mean for the UK, both roughly the minimum we might expect, but also where we may well be going if we follow our current trajectory. And for the minimum we can expect, it makes sense to think about the Paris Agreement, the international agreement where all the countries in the world have agreed to limit global warming to well below two degrees global warming and pursue efforts to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. So somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degrees global warming is the minimum we can expect if the world succeeds in its joint political ambitions. To keep it simple to round numbers, we looked at a two degree global warming world by the end of this century, because at the scale of the UK, the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees, there's quite a lot of possibilities at both of those levels and they overlap a lot. So we looked at, are we prepared for a two degree global warming world, uh, representing the minimum we might expect. In terms of the other scenario, where are we going now? That's a very difficult question. It's not just about physical climate science and the response of the climate system, climate feedbacks and clouds and so on. It's also about literally trying to predict uh, the future of society and economies and so on. And you can't really do that, obviously, because it depends on human choices. It depends on the outcomes of elections. It depends on new technology and so on. Uh, claims are made that you can make certain economic predictions decades in advance. I think they've never been really shown to stand up. Uh, you might also get, I mean, the, the recent COVID pandemic, it, it turns out a relatively small impact on climate immediately, but might have a longer term impact on climate and might put us down a very different path. Exactly. These things just come out of left field and you just uh, completely alters your uh, your economic prediction. So we looked through the literature and worked with a lot of experts on future outcomes for society and emissions and so on. And there's a wide range of future emissions scenarios which are consistent with current global policies on energy and land use and so on. We looked at the range which is considered consistent with current policies. And then we looked at how those play out into the response of the climate system, the level of global warming, taking into account feedbacks from the carbon cycle, such as well, potential tipping points, the loss of the Amazon rainforest, more carbon being released from thawing permafrost, for example, and then accounting for uncertainties and feedbacks in clouds and water vapour and how that affects the rate of warming. And basically, it turns out that on our current trajectory, we could see warming of anywhere between two degrees and four degrees global warming, or possibly even more by the end of this century. There's a bit of a kind of conventional wisdom going around that we're on track for three degrees global warming this century, but that's way too precise, in my opinion. Anywhere between two and four, and possibly more, is where we could be headed. So we chose four degrees global warming as a nice, simple round number there, which is well within the sort of range of possibilities. And I think both those give you, for the purposes of this risk assessment, a fairly clear and understandable framing for the minimum we can expect 
and where we might be going. Rich, thanks for telling us about the science behind the report. But now let's move and talk about what the threats are to the UK and what were the key findings from the report? So there was a huge number of uh, risks that were assessed, 61 individual risks we looked at. They range in terms of whether they're already happening or whether they're emergent risks for the future. So flooding always comes out as a key risk in these assessments for the UK. We've talked about coastal flooding and due to sea level rise, but there's also flooding from heavy rain, swollen rivers, bursting their banks uh, and so on. This impacts the UK already. The UK is putting in place a lot of measures to try and alleviate that risk, but more is still needed. That was a key conclusion from the report. But at the other end of the scale, wildfire was a risk which is more of an emergent one, in my view. We do get fires in the UK, which are damaging and threatening to uh, human health as well as biodiversity, but they're nowhere near on the scale of the fires that we see elsewhere in the world at the moment. However, under a hotter climate, particularly with drier summers, we could expect much more severe fire weather conditions to be emerging. And we're just not sort of set up for dealing with fire risk on the whole. We just don't think about it in the UK. But if we have got places where there's people living in in, in areas which are uh, densely wooded or near heathlands uh, or whatever, they may well need to be thinking about what is the risk of a wildfire happening near where they live. And if we've got any transport systems that are affected by fire, which again does happen, uh, disruption to that may well happen more often. That's really scary because I feel like when we think about wildfires, we think about, you know, the big wildfires last year that happened in California. And you think, oh, that's so far away from home. Unfortunately, the British climate is not like the Californian climate. You know, we get a lot more rain. That won't be a risk here. But in the States, they're really prepared for wildfires as well. You know, they have trained forest fire people and watch stations and a whole infrastructure. When there is a wildfire, they have that whole response set up. So do you think we would have to do something similar in the UK? I think you're right. Yes, absolutely. We, we would have to start thinking much more about how we can prepare for wildfire events, which will be less rare than they are now, especially the severe ones. So whole new ways of living and preparedness would be important. And there's other examples as well, not just the, the wildfire. It is about thinking about what a different climate really means and what it means to live in it. I think that's a, a really hard thing to do as well. Like when you were talking about adaptation and mitigation before, to me, mitigation's always been the friendlier side of climate change because you say, look, the climate's going to change, but, you know, why don't we put new policies in place and ride our bikes to work and we can conquer this. But actually adaptation is coming to terms with the fact that the climate has changed and we need to work out how to live with this. And that's a much scarier concept for me and I'm sure for other people as well. We have to change our lifestyles to adapt to the climate that we are now living in. Exactly. And then the other complication is who foots the bill for all this? Because a lot of measures may need to be put in place by a local authority, you know, the council mm -hmm. or, or, or whatever, but they haven't got infinite resources. Should they get money for central government for this? Should they increase their own council tax or, or whatever? You know, the, the, these things are just only beginning to be discussed about how this is actually worked through. And, and often it's not just one body that owns the problem as well as utility companies, organisations responsible for the railways and the road network, the electricity distribution network and, and so on. There's a huge kind of network of responsibilities here and who actually sorts it out yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it is, a, is a very difficult and challenging problem. One of the things that's always uh, worried me about uh, recent climate changes is that you might see this shift in the climate but you don't see um, the effects of that until they all arrive at once. So what I mean is, you know, often we feel climate change in the extreme value. So the hottest day of the year or the hottest five days of the year or whatever, an extreme heat wave. But those don't happen all that often. So I can imagine this situation where you've shifted climate and then suddenly you get hit by this extreme that's just way higher than anything you've seen before. Was that brought up in the report? Were there any projections that sort of underline that threat to the UK? That was covered as well. So in addition to the technical report that we've been discussing, there's a lot of underpinning science reports that were done especially for this, about a, a dozen reports in different areas like flooding and water resources. And, so on. and one of them was on interacting risks. And it covered this possibility of multiple things happening all at the same time and then cascading risks from that. And again, wildfire is uh, one of those. 
but also high temperatures. When you get super high temperatures, things start failing all over the place. You know, people have started to become ill because of heat stroke and, and so on. But then if your electricity grid has been knocked out because the, you know, the substation or whatever can't cope with high temperatures, then you've got you've got a threat to air conditioning in hospitals uh, and, and so on. If your roads have started to literally melt, as they were doing in Canada and, and the USA, um, if you're affecting the road infrastructure, then emergency vehicles can't be getting around or even just people getting around their day-to-day -day business and doctors and nurses getting to hospitals and so on. So the whole thing all starts to sort of build on itself and one problem lead to another and interacting with another. I think it links back to adaptation as well in, in that scenario. I know in Canada, they get really, really cold winters. And so the houses are designed to retain heat. So they have triple glazed windows and loads of insulation in their loft, but they're not designed for these huge heat waves with ventilation and air conditioning systems. And so they're not prepared for the weather event that did arrive recently. And that's a perfect example of, of not being adapted to the climate you're now in and why we all need to rethink where we are. One of the big areas of economic uh, value in the UK is farming. And I read a recent report by Freya Gary, who's a scientist at the Met Office. And it said that um, there are going to be big impacts of future climate on farming in the UK, particularly on cattle and on potatoes. So the report mentions that cattle are likely to have more days where they're going to be heat stressed in the future. Actually, I think in the southeast it said that there's going to be up to two months a year by the end of the century that the cattle will be heat stressed. And there's also going to be increased risk of potato blight for potatoes, I think, increasing by a quarter in the east of England and up to 75 percent in Scotland. So these are really big risks to farming in the UK. So I was wondering if in the report you also looked into the impact of climate change on farming in the UK. Yeah, there was quite a lot on farming in the UK and land use in general as well. There's things like the direct impacts of more extreme weather, as you said, heat stress on livestock. There's some opportunities uh, as well. This is one area where there may be opportunities if they can be managed. So new crops could be grown under a different climate. Although, as I was saying earlier, you can only realise these opportunities if you can manage the risks coming from elsewhere. There's a big concern over the long term viability of soil carbon, which we need to avoid more carbon coming out of the soils as a feedback on climate change. And actually, we need to be trying to take up more carbon in soils as part of measures to mitigate climate change. So enabling that to be resilient to a warming climate is quite important. And this is where the interaction between adaptation and mitigation comes in. We've got all these approaches for net zero. So enabling us to reduce our emissions, uh, but those in themselves may be sensitive to a changing climate. So farming practices, land use practices, which are put in place for net zero need to be resilient to climate change. Forestry as well, if we're planting new forests, we may be turning some current agricultural land to woodland ultimately to soak up the CO2 from the atmosphere. But we need to make sure that those forests are resilient in the longer term so this carbon stays stored there. So again, a hugely complex area. Actually, the, the natural environment chapter of the technical report was the largest chapter of all. And a lot of that was about farming and land use because it's such a key part of British life and the economy. That was something that was also touched upon in the report, how the UK business and the UK in general will be impacted by overseas changes in climate. Elsewhere in the world, uh, particularly countries that are already hot, uh, the impacts will be even more severe because the world is globally interlinked and we have a lot of travel and political ties and family ties and so on uh, all around the world. Uh, what happens elsewhere in the world will definitely impact the UK. So things like trade, particularly of food, but other, other goods and services, international uh, security. So if the extreme weather starts to play more of a role in areas which are already of a concern from a security perspective, the role of the UK in these kind of security situations will be impacted by that. This could also uh, link with human mobility uh, and migration and so on, both in extreme circumstances, such as when you get a huge disaster or war or, or whatever, but also more generally if, if people are starting to make life choices about where they want to live, partly because they're seeing the climate change 
in terms of trade, one of the most famous opportunities is the opening up of northern sea routes as the Arctic sea ice melts. Ships can get around North America and North Asia, which could change the shape uh, of international trade. But again, it's important not to think about that as purely an opportunity because the loss of sea ice itself has negative impacts. But the point is there's a huge amount of interconnectedness in the world and the UK is part of the wider world. To finish up, I think we've done a, a good job here of covering a lot of the report. But what do we need to do next? What science needs to be commissioned? Uh, what do we need to be thinking about in terms of communicating the findings of this report? We need to continue to improve our ability to assess the impacts of extreme weather within the next few decades. One of the big step changes between this report and the previous report was the new UK climate projections, which have whole new computer models of climate, which are generally better at uh, representing extreme weather. And that was part of the reason why some of the risks are now seen as more urgent than before, because the science has improved and we see that hazards might be greater. But we've still got a lot to learn there, particularly in terms of where the current trajectory is taking us. As I mentioned earlier on, there's a wide range of possibilities for future trajectory. We need to start to narrow those down and be able to really see what are the levels of likely change that we seriously need to make sure we're completely resilient to. So that's an adaptation thing, isn't it? If you need to plan for a particular future. So the mitigation problem seems almost like, well, it's going to be bad. And therefore, what you do is you reduce carbon. <laughs> and yeah. that seems like a pretty easy decision, right? But the adaptation thing is it needs much more technical information about what actually might happen and what the probabilities of that are. It does, but they also interlink as well because the adaptation of the mitigation solutions is important. If the UK is planning a whole raft of net zero measures, many of those need to be resilient to a changing climate. So forestry and farming need to be resilient. We'll be a lot more reliant on electricity as we decarbonise and many more electric vehicles. So the electricity system will be even more important. That needs to be resilient to uh, to a changing climate. But as, as lifestyles and diets change as well, the impacts on cattle, for example, if there's less beef and less dairy being eaten, will less land be taken up by cattle? What will we put in its place? So these are big questions that we don't know the answers to. So a lot more research needs to be done, not only on the physical climate science and predicting the weather and the, and the extreme events, but also seeing where the societal pathways is heading and how our vulnerabilities and exposure will change over time as well. Well, that's it for this edition of Mostly Climate. My thanks to Dr. Rosie Oakes and to Professor Richard Betts. The producers were Claire Nazir and Graham Match, and the editor is Adrian Holloway. My name's Doug McNeil. Thanks for listening.